We are back. Golenbach University. I'm Ralph Tycho, and I have one hell of a panel assembled for Professor Golenbach. We have uh, two or three topics that we want to cover. I'm going to introduce the panel first. Old Reliable, as was T Tommy Henrik. Al Blumpkin is with us. Dodger and all-around baseball historian, podcaster, Peter Trunk is with us, author of Damage and Mick, or Mick and Damage, um, Tony Castro, which one is it? Damage and it's Mick? Damage and Mick. Damage, Damage and, Mick. and Mick. Okay. I had written a, a biography of Mantle back in, uh, in 2002. And uh, I just signed to do a, a, a biography of uh, Joe DiMaggio. Uh, probably won't come out until late 2018, maybe early 2019. So, uh, it's a uh, let's introduce of Peter Golenbach, our professor and host. And um, I want uh, Peter, who has known Tony many years. First of all, welcome back, Tony. You've been on the airwaves with us before. And... Uh, it's a pleasure to have you. You're a Renaissance Thank you. Thank man. You. Like the rest of you guys, you're a Renaissance man. I'm the only man child around. So, um, <laughs> Peter, why don't you start us off and uh, talk to Tony about what it is you want to talk to him about to start the show off. Well, sure. Uh, uh, like I said, I highly, highly, highly recommend his book, uh, Damage, uh, Joe D, and the Mick. Um, you know, I thought I knew everything about these two guys, and I started reading it because obviously I was such a fan of Mantles, and I had such respect for Dimaggio. Uh, but as I started reading, several things occurred to me, and one of the things that occurred to me was that always there was this notion that uh, DiMaggio was always so terribly jealous of Mantle. So in other words, when Mickey came up in 1951, it was Joe DiMaggio's very last season. And uh, Casey Stengel was the manager, and Casey was not treating DiMaggio very well because Casey realized that DiMaggio's skills were ebbing, that he wasn't the great player that he used to be. And so he, he did things like one day – he played Joe DiMaggio at first base and just totally humiliated him. And Joe was not somebody who, who suffered fools lightly, and, and, and DiMaggio just really hated, hated, hated Stengel. Uh, but the, but the, the talk was always that when Mickey Mantle came up, he was the golden boy, and certainly everybody, everybody loved him. And the talk was that DiMaggio didn't treat him very well and was jealous of him. But after reading uh, Joe D. and the Mick, it was clear to me that this was not true. And this is at this point, I think this would be, you know, perfect time for Tony to discourse a little bit on the relationship between Joe DiMaggio and Mickey Mantle. Well, I think DiMaggio got a bad, you know, bum rap there in the 50s uh, from a number of different places. You know, DiMaggio was not the most forthcoming of individuals uh, and I don't know, happen to know that personally. I mean, I'm, I, I was a child when DiMaggio uh, right, of retired course. for most, most of us here. And, uh, and DiMaggio was one of these guys who, uh, first of all, this team in 1951, he was like the senior citizen of that team. Uh, there, was, there was only uh, maybe two or three people who had played with DiMaggio in 1941 who were still on that team. And a couple of them were coaches, if I'm not mistaken. So this was not, you know, it was Joe's team only because he was the the, the name of the, uh, of the on the Yankees roster. Uh, Mickey Mantle from day one was the player's uh, teammate's player, you know, teammate's friend, and I think on his tombstone it even says something to that effect. And uh, well liked by everybody who ever played with him. Uh, you know, obviously the most popular uh, person in the Yankees organization, maybe in Yankee history. Uh, and so it, it worked that way, not only with the players, but also with the uh, working press at that time. DiMaggio wasn't one to, as you uh, said, you know, to suffer fools. And uh, 
you know, unfortunately, among our brethren, there are a number of people who would qualify under that description, uh, both yeah. then and now. And yeah. uh, it's, it's a DiMaggio, nobody really knew that much about DiMaggio. The media was different at that time. You didn't have uh, the news cycle that you have right now. And DiMaggio, I mean, for, first and foremost, I mean, in this age of what's happening to immigrants and everything, DiMaggio was an immigrant's son. His, yep. uh, he grew up with English as his second language. He, uh, when he got to New York, he was probably, you know, it wasn't like he was staying in his home hotel room and holed up there as the story has gone. Dimaggio was out eating uh, in, you know, every night eating in any Italian family home that uh, that he wanted to. Got a lot of invitations that way. I, I, uh, the uh, the family of the people that owned, uh, gosh, I'm, I'm drawing a, a senior moment here, but that owned the uh, uh, the deli, the stage deli, uh, where DiMaggio and Mandel and others uh, often went to eat for free. Uh, the son was telling me that his father often talked about how uh, you had to really hustle to get to, uh, DiMaggio and Mandel there because they had so many options of where they could go to eat for free, restaurants, family homes. And DiMaggio's case, I mean, the best Italian food to eat for an old Italian boy or a young Italian uh, a kid, you know, one in his 20s and his 30s, was some of the homes of some of these Italian Americans there in uh, Little Italy and, and uh, in New Jersey, and that's what Joe spent a great deal of his time. In. And so uh, uh, that, that's just his background as to DiMaggio and the mystery surrounding him as to who he was and where he was, as far as with the team and what happened afterwards. The, uh, you know, a lot of what, uh, there are two or three things that I think we have to, to keep in mind that pretty much set in tone uh, what was going to be written about DiMaggio later in that biography of 2000 by, uh, oh, my God, another senior moment, I can't think of his name. Yeah, uh, was that one, you know, DiMaggio, by the time I was a teenager, he certainly wasn't around. You would see him at the Yankee old-timers games or at the, uh, multiple Mickey Mantle days that they had in New York. Uh, he was Mr. Coffee and the guy who had been married to, to Marilyn. Few of us, and, and, you know, YouTube wasn't available. You couldn't go on there and watch Joe DiMaggio uh, swinging away and, and anything like that. So you had this, you know, Joe was a forgotten guy. Uh, he was a, an elder uh, statesman, and... Uh, uh, he happened to hook up maybe with the wrong guy, this lawyer who he was with for until his death, a lawyer from uh, – uh, Yeah, terrible character. Yeah, yes. whatever his name was, from uh, Florida, uh, who didn't do him any favors. And and uh, Joe quickly gained the reputation there, in the, especially as, uh, in the 80s with the uh, rise of, of, uh, of memorabilia. Uh, right. This lawyer – uh, made Joe seem like a miser and a guy who wasn't going to show up anywhere except for money and a lot of He really it. did. He really did. Yeah. And he separated so, Joe from a lot of his friends, too. Exactly, those that he had, except the, the little yeah. crowd of people that he had in New York and the others that he had in San Francisco. So you come into this period where uh, 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 Richard Ben Kramer put, starts putting together this biography of, of DiMaggio, and one other thing had happened. The best thing that had ever been written on DiMaggio was the Esquire, was it Esquire piece? Or, uh, uh, yeah, I think it was written? Esquire piece, yes, yes, by, uh, yeah. uh, by uh, Day Talese. And Day Talese. Talese, if, anybody, if anybody should have profiled or written the biography of Joe DiMaggio, it should have been Day Talese, you know, a fellow Italian, a kid who grew up there during the days of, of DiMaggio, who idolized DiMaggio but who, like a lot of us who were, uh, you know, born in immigrant families in this uh, country, uh, you know, we want to be too middle, too mainstream. And uh, uh, Talese uh, has never, except for a few things that he's written, has never fully identified himself uh, in the way that maybe someone could say, hey, you know, here's the guy who should be writing the great American Italian story. Mm-hmm. And he didn't. And, and when he had the shot yeah. in the 60s of doing this with, with DiMaggio, he didn't. You know, he didn't really yeah. go into the DiMaggio story, which I think the last time I was on the show, we talked about how 
you know, in 41, DiMaggio has one of the greatest seasons ever in baseball, right? I mean, he hits in 56 consecutive games. Uh, they're writing songs about him. The, the big band leader has, you know, the, uh, the Don't Think Joe DiMaggio song. This is going on in the summer of, of 41. In, in the December of 41, uh, the Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor and we go into war. In the beginning of that following year, in 1942, as we go into war, what happens? You know, everybody's familiar with how Japanese Americans in this country, especially on the West Coast, were thrown into detention camps. Well, the same thing happened. It turned out for about 10,000 Italian Americans, and those for whom it didn't happen were restricted as far as what they could, uh, what, the things they could do. They had to carry around uh, uh, papers that showed yep. that they were here in this country legally. They had, were restricted to being within five miles of their residence, and if they went beyond that, they had to get uh, permission, much like if, you know, if you're on probation and, you know, I've got to go out of Los Angeles because I'm on probation. Well, uh, you know, you're, they had what amounted to probation officers uh, saying they could do these things. The DiMaggio family took a big hit. DiMaggio's restaurant, Joe DiMaggio's Grotto there in uh, Fisherman's Wharf, uh, took a tremendous hit because the, 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 Joe's oldest brother ran it, but the, uh, oh. the father was often there. The, the yeah. fishing boat that the uh, family had uh, wound up being confiscated by the government and never returned. And DiMaggio, uh, you know, uh, Rino Barsacchini, his longtime best friend, was telling me about it later how nobody ever really, it, it never occurred to people just the, what Joe went through there in 1942, where he was just embittered and angry at how his family was being treated, at how uh, other uh, Italians were being treated. And uh, this and how people had forgotten that just uh, a few months earlier he had been the hero of, uh, of America. He had helped us right. forget about this war looming in, 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 in Europe. And uh, up until the bombing at Pearl Harbor, there was a tremendous sentiment. The, the popular sentiment was against the U.S. going into war, regardless of what was going on in, in Nazi Germany and all the, the war uh, crimes that occurred there. Uh, the popular sentiment was, we don't want to go to war until that America happened. First. And when that happened, uh, you know, the Japanese get taken to detention camps, and the Italians oh. wind up, many of them, uh, suffering the uh, suffering all of uh, of what happened there. So DiMaggio, uh, that, that's no excuse for maybe the way he behaved, but DiMaggio was uh, this person that perhaps could have been best identified, best described, best profiled to America by the greatest uh, Italian-American uh, writer, at least of my time, and it, yeah. he wasn't. So you have uh, Richard Ben Kramer writing this book, which for the most part has set in stone how so many people feel about uh, DiMaggio because it portrays him in the worst possible light that, I, that it possibly could have. Uh, well, but, you know, but, some of the other – anyway, you, I've you, talked long you, enough. You, you, no, that's all right. But what I'm saying is that one of the reasons it's he was depicted the way he was depicted was that for a lot of people who Ben Kramer interviewed, DiMaggio didn't treat them very well. And so they told these stories. Not only that, but you got stories, for instance, they had they had a, an earthquake where DiMaggio's house was. And, and I think my favorite scene in the whole book was after the, the place was almost demolished, DiMaggio – uh, gets gets permission to go into his home where he goes under the bed and he grabs a uh, garbage bag, which he drags out. And according to Ben, ben Kramer, uh, DiMaggio didn't trust banks. He didn't trust many people, period. But he didn't trust the banks, apparently, and walked out of there with $800,000 in cash. It's my absolute oh. favorite story in the book. Uh, so there, there, was rumors, there were rumors, too, that he was holding mob money, that he made a practice of that. Um, and I think Kramer goes into that in the book a little bit. That um, Yeah, there were ties to, to the mob. I mean, you know, the... Uh, the they first, loved him. He was there. When, uh, uh, was when the Marjorie married through. Dorothy, uh, the, his first wife, his uh, engagement ring for Dorothy was bought by uh, a mob guy. I mean, that's... <laughs> Uh, you know why? Uh, 
Uh, I don't know. Maybe, but there was also a mob guy uh, back in the 40s who was involved in, uh, 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 in the concession stand with the New York Yankees. I mean, it's a little-known story. So, I mean, it's not like the, bo- the mob was just uh, here and there. I mean, it's, it's influence throughout many parts of our country, and especially in New York, are there for the, the pickings. And the only thing I can say about the Richard Ben Kramer thing is that, you know, he got a pass, I think, and a, a lot of us were at different times when we won a war. You know, the next time you come around to writing about something, you get a pass on it. You know, if you bombed on your previous book or your, or your reporting, you're, you're not going to get that pass. He had written this Pulitzer Prize winning book of the 1992 campaign of uh, 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 Bill Clinton. It was a marvelous book. Yeah, you know, I've got it, it sitting it, right it, behind me on my desk here. And, it, and, it, and so then he gets this deal to do the uh, Dimash biography. And there again, you know, I, I don't, I didn't know Richard Ben Kramer. We, you know, I, I sent him a couple of letters, which I got a couple of, of responses back before his passing, but uh, uh-huh. nothing significant. And right. the thing I, I know about reporting is you, know, you really need to talk to both sides of people on something. And, and the more people are telling you nasty stories about someone, uh, you, you know, the, the more I've always found it incumbent. Uh, as a political reporter, as a, uh, 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 I started reporting in 19, you know, when I was 16 years old at Daily. Mm-hmm. And the, yeah. the one thing that these old newspaper guys would say to you when you'd come back with a story, well, okay, well, like, let's see, let's balance this out. So have you talked to people on this? And what do they say about this? Uh, you know, does this guy really stick cigars in babies' mouths? I mean, it's a great anecdote. Yeah. But, as, <clears throat> so that's the only thing I can say about that. I mean, I, 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 I I'm not there to, you know, point by, you know, uh, in, in, so, by in, other words, in other words, in other words, you have you know, the sense, you have the sense that Ben Kramer didn't try to find enough people who had something positive to say about DiMaggio. Or another side of it, or, or, or this whole thing. I mean, you know, look, uh, I'm not saying that you can excuse for the way DiMaggio was to uh, people, and, and I haven't found that many instances of DiMaggio just being, you know, an utter a-hole to people. Uh, right. You know, that point in, point out, you know, that everybody I'm talking to. But you, uh, this whole thing of what happened to him when he was, you know, this uh, this guy and uh, this young Italian-American who on the one hand for is the pride of New York and the pride of Italians and, and, the, and uh, from the mid-30s on until the war and then uh, even afterwards, but of the, what happened to his family in 1942, uh, and, and, and it says so much more about America as a whole than just about Joe DiMaggio. I mean, wow. how do people feel about things like that? We're seeing it today, you know, uh, for crying out loud, 150 years after uh, uh, the Emancipation Proclamation, and we still know, ha- have uh, you know, questionable civility in terms of race relations. That's right. And I, and I think that when it comes to, to something like this, you have, a, 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 you know, it's not the same thing as black and white uh, relations in this country, but it is ethnic relations in this country. Right now there's this tremendous show that was, uh, it's a reprise of a show that uh, began in 1978 here in Los Angeles, wound up going to Broadway, winning an Emmy for uh, – uh, Edward James Olmos, the actor, and mm-hmm. it's called Zoot Suit, and it's about oh. something that happened here in Los Angeles in the ni- early 1940s, where uh, sailors that were at, uh, here at uh, dock, the ships that had docked uh, at the ports here wound up going on this rampage through downtown and uh, the east side of Los Angeles, beating up uh, Latinos at that point, and this right. uh, this play called Zoot Suit, uh, profiled that in the late 70s, and I remember going to it at that time and uh, and seeing people leaving the thing just angry because people didn't realize what had happened. And, you know, we, we're all ignorant of our own history, it seems like, sure, especially course. our own. And so here they were seeing something that, had, you know, you had Hispanics leaving the theater, both in the 70s and again today. And it's like, how could they do that? And why didn't we do something about it? And how could they get away with it? 
I mean, well, we could we could have an entire we could have conversation that. right exactly. now, but we're not going to and do so that. I'm, what, I'm, what I'm saying is that <laughs> the, the, let me throw let me throw, let me throw something in that. here, if I might. Both DiMaggio and Ted Williams were so portrayed so negatively over memorabilia, signing bats, signing autographs, all of this. You have to remember that these guys played when their maximum salary was like $100,000 a year. Mm-hmm. At the height. Now, the height. including inflation, which would make it 500000 600000 that's a minimum salary of somebody coming into ball. So yeah. these guys are retired. They um, have these illustrious uh, memories and um, – Everybody looks at these guys as heroes. They weren't being paid much. And the memorabilia industry was going nuts. And both um, Williams, who took advice from his son, and DiMaggio, who took advice from that attorney, were just machines in in putting out autographs. And um, they were allegedly forging autographs for these guys, and that affected, because it was money and people are used to bringing down their heroes, that was so much a big part of their negative image in their in the major biographies that were written about them. Yeah, and, a good point. Uh, you know, uh, just brings out the ugliness and, and a part of, of a lot of fans and how we wind up looking upon people. You know, when you consider Magic Johnson and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and their relative uh, standing in Los Angeles, there's no question about Magic's popularity compared to Kareem's as well. One of the reasons is that you can go around and, and talk to people, and they'll tell you these horrible stories about Kareem refusing to sign. You know, they'll see him in, in, uh, at a restaurant or whatever and come up and give him an napkin. Uh, Kareem, uh, uh, or Mr. Jabbar, will you sign this one? You know, you know he didn't. I, I personally saw this a, a, a couple of times. I was like, my God, uh, it's not worth not signing. You know, uh, sign I want to throw in that DiMaggio gave a lot of money to a hospital in Florida and uh, put a wing up and um, really gave the bulk of his estate away um, to this hospital. He wasn't the money-grabbing miser it was almost the way of, ma- of these guys making a living. It's like Mr. Coffee, the, that kind of thing. Uh, Bowery Savings at, Bank. Yeah, yeah. Bowery, Bowery Savings, Savings Bank. Bank. Exactly. <clears throat> the, what, um, what, you know, one thing I want to add is uh, his brother Dominic, who was an excellent player in his own right, was extremely popular in Boston. Uh, he was very civically minded. He was a philanthropist, and he always had time for people. He was loved up there. Right. Um, no, no, that's true. He was, he was and Jimmy Fung. Reputedly a much yeah. happier man in life. Well, oh, yeah. I mean, he had a wonderful family. He had children. Uh, he stayed home. He had he, he, he owned a business that was very, very successful. Uh, Joe DiMaggio was, like Bob Feller, America's guest. Uh, DiMaggio spent <laughs> most of his you know, later, you know, 20 or so years um, being a speaker at various functions where they paid him a lot of money to speak. And he did he did get quite a bit of money for, for signing his name over and over and over and over again. His, his job was being Joe DiMaggio. His job was being Joe DiMaggio. There's yeah. no question about yeah, that. Yeah, and he, he expected to be paid for it. I remember uh, you know, the stories about him uh, uh, giving away uh, – giving golf clubs to people and it's uh they're in the, the house in the, uh in san francisco in the garage he must have had maybe two dozen sets of golf clubs that they had co- he had collected in recent years because every time he was invited somewhere to play golf uh the you know pro-am or to a charity he would show up and he, his thing was you know, he would demand to be uh given a set of golf clubs uh, you know, and, shirts and, and sweaters and exactly. uh, pa- paraphernalia and 
what have you. Yeah, he was uh, he was Kurt. That's he was you know, the, the Pete Rose of his period. You know, in terms of you know Pete the same way even today. Uh, Pete used to well, except that Pete is happy to see you. Pete. Yeah, well, Pete uh, is always happy to see you. I was with Pete last week, and there's thousands of people stood in line to get Pete Rose's autograph, and he was as charming and as nice and as hospitable. And what's your name, sir? And and yes, he got paid to sign autographs, but he could not have been nicer. And I was with Pete's one of the nicest guys, that, you know, that, that you'll find. And uh, I. I I had uh, my oldest son was the same age as Pete's youngest son, uh, uh, Tyler, and we went, somehow or other out here, I wound up. Uh, I don't know if I told you the story. I wound up uh, coaching little league baseball with Pete. Our kids were the same age. We coached little league baseball mainly because nobody wanted to, to coach with Pete because they were all afraid of Pete. And well, they were in awe. They must uh, have been in awe of him. I yeah, mean, incredible. You wouldn't want to. And, you wouldn't want to yes. you know, try to tell Pete Rose how to play baseball for crying out loud. And, and so they're, they're living out here in Los Angeles, and Pete is showing up to every little league practice of, uh, that his son played on from the time he was wow. 10. When, I think he showed up here when he was 10 and played uh, baseball through his t- mid-teens. And Pete was always at every practice. I mean, how would you feel being a, a little league coach who's out there and, and you've got somebody sitting on the front row of the stands you know, practice in day on day out, watching what you're telling. And most of these kids, and most of these parents, you know, we're all well-meaning, but we know uh, little about baseball beyond what we learned from terrible coaches when we were in high school. You know, right? Of course. But you would think and, that everybody would just be thrilled to death to have Pete Rose involved with your team. Everybody, <laughs> you would think. Hey, if you I, 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 the gambling I, thing out of Pete's mind, out of people's mind. Pete Rose would be the most coveted baseball instructor going. I did an interview with Joel Youngblood, who had Mm -hmm. a terrific career, mostly with the Mets and the Giants, but he broke in with Pete um, after Pete, but while Pete was with the Big Red Machine, and after his career was winding down, he ended up... Uh, under Pete when he was managing in in Cincinnati. Right. Um, Joel talks so highly of his communication skills, of his intensity, and um, I'm going to throw something out for you guys. I think he's the most underrated hitter going. If a guy uh, would look, at, look at his three, numbers, Ralph. Look at no, his numbers. Uh, but I. I will look at his numbers and tell you he hit a lot more doubles than George Brett. And, That's right. Um, and That's what I'm saying. Look at his numbers. They were terrific numbers. They, he wasn't just a punch and Judy hitter, as the reputation is. I think Mantle made a made a little remark to him once. He said, "Listen, um, if I had if I hit 1,200, if I hit." 12 homers a year, I'd wear a dress or something. Wear a dress, yes. But he had punch. (laughs) He didn't have, obviously, he didn't have the power of the big guys, but he had a lot more punch than um, uh, uh, is given credit for. And he was, you know, a gap hitter and an incredible overachiever. It doesn't matter, Ralph. It doesn't matter if he got 200 singles a year. It doesn't matter. He played for 24 years, and he got 200 hits each year. Right. And most players never, literally never, get 200 hits in a season. I can't tell you. I can't tell you how difficult that is. This guy was truly one of the most amazing ball players of the last 50 years. He and was. Well, you've seen him on. Versatile, incredibly versatile, could play like. He was an all star at third base, second base, left field, right field, and first base. He was an all star at five different positions. And right. what do you he know? took a Philadelphia Philly team to a World Series in 80, and he obviously took the big red machine yeah, to several. Yeah, three also. Right, that team in 83 wasn't all that good. Right. 
Exactly. Peter Trunk, you're a National League fan. Give me your impression of Peter, of Peter Rose. My God. I have um, I have all the respect in the world for Pete Rose. I do. And uh, I have to agree with almost every statement I've heard about him in the last five, six minutes. Uh, the thing that's going to keep him out of the Hall of Fame, according to, according to Mike Schmidt, Mike Schmidt was quoted three or four days ago, Pete Rose will never be elected to the Hall of Fame. Now, that's a strong statement coming from now, another Hall of Fame. why did he say that? What's he his, said what's he's his reason? because because his reasoning, as I read it, Peter, is th- is thus: um, he he still to this day refuses to uh, eat any shit. In other words, he will not go back. Uh, you know, he still makes statements such as this. I'm going to paraphrase. He just said this last week. Uh, what I do in my free time, if I go if I go somewhere and make a, a legal bet on something and then go home and watch it on TV. I'm not hurting anybody. Well, you know what, Pete? Rose, that is, not going back or myself. <laughs> you know what, Pete? That's why you're in so much hot water. That's why you're not going to make the Hall of Fame. You still have the chip on your shoulder. You're the type of man who's not going to let that go. You're just not going to. To let that go. I don't know if you guys. The the cover up and the lies are always worse. You know what? Nixon taught us that. um, I'm going to make an analogy, and and, and it's not going to be political, although you know I'm in bed with you when it comes to politics. Uh, I'm going to make a Seinfeld uh, analogy. Remember the show on Seinfeld when George. The, the, uh, George and and Jerry are selling their show to NBC, and yep. they have people to play Kramer. They have people to person to play uh, George. They have person to play Elaine. Well, the yep. guy who's playing Kramer comes in. The guy who plays Kramer comes in, and he starts eating raisins. That there's a box of raisins on the on the table during his interview, and when right. the interview is over. When the interview is over, the raisins are are, are missing. This is a box of raisins, yep. okay? And George won't let it go. George yep. Costanza will not let it go. Every time he talks to this guy, he says, you know, it's kind of funny. You come in there, there's raisins. We talk a little while. You leave, and uh, no raisins. They're gone. And, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. Like, this is the trouble with Pete Rose. He can never let it go. While I'm Good point. Speaking. Great point. While I'm speaking, thank you. While I'm speaking, I'd like to double back to DiMaggio, if I may. Go ahead. I enjoyed the Kramer book. I enjoyed the Kramer book a lot. I read it as soon as it came out, et cetera, et cetera. And I knew he was a Pulitzer Prize winner, and I knew that this was not just some uh, stupid Joe walking down the street saying, hey, I'm going I'm to write a, a, a scathing negative book on an American uh, baseball star, an American icon, Joe DiMaggio. I don't think he set out to do that. I think what happened – now, Peter Golomack, you've written more books than I've read. And <laughs> you probably and you'll probably be able to comment much, much better than I do on this one. But is it not true if a guy like Kramer, Kramer write, starts writing a book and he starts interviewing people and he starts getting these stories – and one after the other, they're, they're negative. And one after the other, they line up negative, negative, negative. You know, how can you search out positive things? If you're just searching out people to interview and they keep telling you these stories that are not so uh, hunky-dory about Joe D., well, then that's, that's how your book is going to be. Look at the books that have been written and the articles that have been written about uh, Walter O'Malley. Okay, some of them are scathing. He was this rotten son of a bitch. Others, he was the greatest thing since sliced bread. He brought baseball to the West Coast. He was a savior. He was this. He was that. Here's what bothers me about DiMaggio. Okay, okay. And, and you might roll your eyes, and if you want to roll your eyes, that's fine with me. But this is just if crazy. I'm rolling your my I'll, eyes, you'll never you'll never see it. <laughs> I'll feel it. Uh, I don't care that Kramer said 
that when uh, he was using uh, black sharpies to sign his name on baseball, and when the and when the sharpie would get dull, he would put it aside. And at the end of his show, the whole weekend, in his contract was he could bring those sharpies home with him. That was part of the deal. Okay. The the other thing was like. Uh, the, the thing that bothered me, why didn't he go to Mickey Mantle's funeral? I mean, if he had a cold, if he had the flu, he should have gotten that lawyer friend of his to wheel him in there to make an appearance at Mickey Mantle's. That was bad, bad form, not going to Mickey Mantle's funeral, to me, personally. All right. That's it. Okay. And then, and then they say, uh, so-and-so and so-and-so, two other Yankees would pick him up outside of San Francisco and drive in a car across America down to spring training. And the other two Yankees swear that they made that trip more than once and all the way, and it must have taken a week, I don't know, he never said one word. Talk about backward and no personality. No, it was it was Crosetti, I mean, okay. it was Crosetti and, and the fabulous second baseman, uh, Lazari. Lazari. Lazari, for the two. Him up yeah, those were the, those him were the up two who yeah, drove right. with them. And that's the story right. that they told. Yeah. And it's, well, it's you know, not something... inconceivable because when no, he not. was young, it's not inconceivable because no, English was, in fact, his second language, and he was not an educated man, and he was very um, – he, he felt he felt very uncomfortable with his limited uh, education. Peter, I, I remember something you wrote in, you, in your book, Dynasty, when uh -huh. he first came to New York, they asked yeah. him, Mr. DiMaggio, I'd like a quote. Yeah. And he thought a quote was a soft drink. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah he, he, he didn't. He didn't know what a quote was. No, that's didn't true. know what a quote was. But no. you ha also have to remember, he wasn't brought up in San Francisco. He was brought up in a little town east right. of San Francisco called Martinez. Happened Martinez, to be yes. the capital of Contra Costa County or, or whatever at this time. It's a nice little town. It's a, it's a hick fishing town um, back in those days. These, uh, there was no public schools. There were, I mean, he knew how to play baseball, and he knew how to fish, and that was it. Well, um, he actually hated fishing. The funny thing is, the thing I found out was that he hated fishing. He hated the smell of fish. He got seasick. He hated being out on the boats. And for the most part, his father wanted him to follow in his footsteps, and he wouldn't do it. But he was very fortunate because he had two other brothers, Vince and Dom, who became baseball players. And because they became baseball players, he could become a baseball player. And thank heaven that baseball. he did, because he was certainly one of the greatest, you know, greatest that ever was. Tony, hey, this great did you story. know anything about his brother, his bro not Dom, the other brother that played uh, Vince? Did, did you? Well, yeah, um, a little bit had uh, paved the way for DiMaggio, for Joe to play uh, with the Seals, the uh, uh, minor league team in San Francisco. But what I was going to tell you about was in, oh, God, it must have been uh, the early 80s, I was assigned to do a profile of, on Susan Strasberg, who was uh, an actress. Uh, she's no longer with us. And I didn't know mm -hmm. a great deal about Susan Strasberg, and they gave me a bunch of clips there at the Los Angeles Herald Examiner where I was working. I go and interview her. And I'm thinking, God, I hate this interview. Uh, early on, uh, she said something about uh, uh, Marilyn, and it didn't, you know, it took me a little bit. And I asked her, "What do you mean? Did you know Marilyn Monroe?" Well, talk about a stupid question because it turned out she had been Marilyn Monroe's best friend, or one of the two That's best right. friends that Marilyn That's had. That's right. Her dad, was, her dad was his co her coach. Yeah, dad, mom, the coach. great uh, <laughs> coaching, uh, acting coaches. So she's, we start talking. The moment she said to Maja, you know, my interest just perked up, and, and she's telling me all these stories. Among the things she, she said to me was that Marilyn had thought about Joe as being the most innocent guy she had ever been around, and that was one of the things that she loved about Joe. When he not, you know, he, she didn't know much about his, 
his heroics on the field. It was who he was, this innocent, uh, unpresuming guy. And she starts telling me about how Marilyn told her these stories of how in uh, 19, you know, they met in 51, but they didn't really hit it off until 52. And she's telling Joe, I mean, imagine this, Marilyn Monroe giving Joe the one, two, threes on uh, politics in, in 1952 about, uh, 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 you know, that was the race for White Eisenhower and uh, oh, Adlai Stevenson. Adlai huh? Adlai Stevenson. Adlai Stevenson. And uh, she's, so, I mean, can you imagine this? You know, Marilyn Monroe and the, what so much of America has long thought of her, giving the one, two, threes on American politics to Joe DiMaggio. That's how, you know, uh, this guy who had never finished high school, never gone to college, uh, not very, uh, you know, just he, his presence looked more polished than he actually was. Mm-hmm. He was tall, slender, wore a suit like we all wished we could, even today, you know. And it just, uh, it's hard to figure out that this guy was this guy who could, uh, who could be so innocent of, and, uh, and so, I mean, that's, uh, that's, that was an incredible story I came away with on this, that, that, uh, DiMaggio was not, uh, not who he was. I, I suppose no more so than Mickey Mantle. You know, Mantle, uh, met a lot of presidents. I mean, I guess the best political quote that's ever been attributed to a baseball player is the, the one to Babe Ruth back when uh, somebody said, you feel bad that uh, you made more money than the president. He said, no, I had a better year. Yeah, that's right. Cool. <laughs> yeah, but DiMaggio, uh, the best quote about Mano rather, not DiMaggio, he was, the, he was the great teammate. That's all he wanted to be, Mickey. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, he, that's what's on his plaque in center field. At, at, uh, I think that's what's on his, uh, as Tony said, I think that's what was on his uh, uh, marker there. Uh, yeah. Marker, the right uh, But, I mean, he was that way. When you talk to the kids that he went to high school with and the ones he played with, and uh, they're in uh, Baxter Springs, uh, Missouri, and you know, next to uh, Oklahoma, they all talked about how, yeah, he had all this incredible power, but he's also the, the, the greatest kid to be around uh you know always cheering you on always doing these these other things i mean that's uh, uh you know you see so much stuff on i mean uh, what netflix ought to do peter we ought to get together on this and pitch netflix a thing on mickey the uh the younger years uh, uh i mean okay. I'm, I'm just you know i'm okay. thinking that off the top of my head but i'm i'm just saying there's so much stuff on some of these other netflix and others that you have to wonder how in the hell did they ever get this on there? Well, you know, do a show on on the young Mickey, the the boy who would be Mick, or something. Because the the stories that these kids have told, and many of them are no longer with us, but uh, you know, I, I I've seen them in all biographies. I wound up spending some time down there. Jane Le- Levy spent a, an incredible amount of time with them. Uh, oh, and she she has some incredible quotes incredible pieces showing yeah. his sense of humor he was genuinely a funny i don't care what anybody thinks of me kind of guy and yeah. you, have, you, you haven't read, read you you haven't read seven have you i haven't well you read my book seven you want to see how funny he is he was the funniest <laughs> person who wasn't a professional comedian who i knew he we was hilarious yeah. Uh, I don't know why I hadn't to, thought about any of this, but uh, that's... Uh, Jane, uh, Jane Levy tells a story of him having to apologize, and I put that in quotes, to a group of women, that one in particular, that he offended at one of these meet and greet kind of things. And <laughs> first of all, what he said was incredibly profane and funny at the same time. But his apology to this woman was unbelievably. I put the book down and I just started crying from laughter. I mean, it was just funny. <laughs> no, I, I was at a baseball writer's dinner here, and uh, Mickey was uh, had to uh, present an award, a good guy award to Lee McPhail. And met, uh, Mickey uh, had a few drinks at that point, and he got up there and said, uh, "You know, I made a present this." 
good guy at war to Lee McPhail. He was the assistant general manager when I was in, playing with the Yankees to uh, George Weiss, the meanest, and he used a ten-letter word beginning with C and ending with R that ever was. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole place erupted. And what they did with that was they used it as an excuse to bar kids under 18 uh, to this thing and open it up to women. That was a big thing. The whole point he was hilarious. hilarious. The next day, the, the papers reported his remarks as irreverent. Irreverent. Uh, <laughs> his, his favorite word, I do believe, his favorite word was puss. Yeah. P-U-S-S, puss. And, yes. and he would use that in such a way, you would just be <laughs> on the floor laughing. He was so hysterical. <laughs> Well, I think as that as was the word he used to Pete Rose, if I'm not mistaken. I don't po- doubt it. His greatest political statement was at those hearings when Casey Spengel wanted that ramble. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, ramble for whatever, however late they asked Mantle uh, what his views were, and he says, I agree with Casey. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> that was it. great. I know it. But he said, <laughs> well, 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 let me ask you one question week, that that somebody touched on here with uh, with Pete Rose. If if we hear we're voting on him up or down, Pete uh, in the Hall of Fame. I, I'm just curious as to how you guys would vote. Did somebody text you that? Right now, no, no, somebody... I'm just curious. No, I'm just curious. Oh, I, I, so, uh, oh. okay. Well, um, you know, I did this book with Lenny Dykstra, right? Who was on the Phillies? when Pete was the manager of the Reds at the time he was betting on baseball. Uh And the story that Lenny told me was this. He'd be in the the Philly dugout. And what he realized was that Pete was not betting on his team to either win or lose. That wasn't the issue at all. The issue was the over and under. So before each game, Las Vegas would have a line, say – Right. Uh, the number was seven. So, in other words, right. if the two teams together scored eight runs, if you took the over, you won the bet. If, if, mm-hmm. if they scored six runs, if you had the mm-hmm. under, you won the bet. That's called the over and the under. And according to and if Randy, they scored seven runs, it was called a push. It was a push. So they nobody always made it a half. A half. That's why they yeah. made it a half. Yeah. At any rate, mm-hmm. at any rate, the Phillies would be watching Pete closely because they realized somehow they knew that he was in very deep trouble with the mob at the time, that he really <clears throat> was into them for a lot of money. And according to Dykstra, what would happen is that Pete's pitcher would be in trouble. Mm-hmm. The inning would be over, and it would be his turn to bat. And in ordinary circumstances, the manager would pinch hit for that pitcher and put in a new pitcher. Very interesting. But the Phillies were sure yes. that, say, Pete had the uh, over. <laughs> yeah, and so he would leave that pitcher in the game the next inning to get shelled. Mm-hmm. And he could that still was, win the game and not throw yeah. the game right? and win and get the over at the same time. That's, that, that's exactly right. And the Philadelphia Philly players all apparently knew it. Very so that's, interesting. That's, that's what he the, was doing. Wow. That's a wow. Peter Gollenbach, that is a that is the first time I ever heard that, and that makes a hundred percent sense. And that that is a great great thing that you just I lo- I can't wait to get off the phone so I can tell my friends. <laughs> well, <laughs> and there's there's one other thing too that. Um, they talk about that when he made a bet, they thought the bookies thought that it was because they thought that he thought the team could win. When he didn't make a bet, that was the excuse for for keeping him out of the Hall of Fame. Is that he didn't bet against his team, but in essence, he was telling the bookies, mm-hmm. uh, giving them a tip. No, he was probably fooling the bookies in the, in the sense that he was betting the over and under, or he was at least fooling the mass of people, including myself, who thought that 
that was the way it was. Wow, what a revelation, Peter Golenbach. Um, yes. Um, I love it. Whoa. <laughs> whoa. Peter, Chuck wow, and I were both, uh, while you're talking, we're going, wow. <laughs> this is something. Whoa. How about I, this? I, I, How about I, I, on that note? On that yeah. note, let's say let's say so long for the week, and why don't we pick this up next week? Because because I still have a lot of things that I want to ask Tony about that we haven't even talked to talked about. How about that? Beautiful. Yeah. Can you come back I next feel, week, Tony? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm free next week. I, I feel like uh, asking that question that the guy from Dumb and Dumber asked uh, about whether you know what was the uh, so you're saying there's still a chance. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 you Were know, you saying there's a chance we could talk about your book, Tony. No, a chance we could, a chance for Pete getting into the Hall of Fame. It's, uh, I still oh, think oh. there is. I still think <laughs> there is. I, I still I, think I, there is I, a chance. I think there is, yeah. I, I absolutely, uh, I, I think right now the sentiment, most people, most people who talk about it on Facebook want him in. Most people, look, George Steinbrenner, was given two life sentences, the first time for his Watergate nonsense and the second time for Howie Spira. Two lifetime, uh, uh, whatever you call them. Bans. Yeah. Bans from the team. Bans. Bans. He was banned twice. He was banned. And both times, both times, one from Bowie Kuhn and once from um, my buddy. Uh, Faye Vincent. Faye Vincent. Yeah. No. Vincent. Faye Vincent. And once from Faye Vincent, they reduced both lifetime bans to two years. Now, Pete Rose was given his lifetime ban, and six weeks later, Bart Giamatti dropped dead. There was no chance for Bart Giamatti at some point to say, we'll reduce the lifetime ban to two years. And as a result of that, mm -hmm. Pete has been banned since then. Right. If he hadn't died, he'd be in the Hall of Fame right now. Well, P has been his own so. worst enemy. I don't oh, care. Yeah. Don't I don't Literally. care. I don't care. The guy got nine million hits. The guy won many, many pennants. He was a great, great ball player as a player. We know as a that. manager, he did stupid things, very stupid you know, we things. We know that, but the thing is, I mean, it's a tragedy, not quite on the, not quite on the level as the uh, Shoeless Joe Jackson and the Black Sox. But it's a tragedy. But I think, you know, since he, 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 he admitted guilt by signing that paper. And, uh, yes, know, he I did. Can't, can't he did. Explain. He admitted guilt by signing that paper. And, and, and Pete and I, back when that happened, were pretty close. And he told me, I mean, he said he, said he spent a million dollars on lawyers. And the deal mm -hmm. was that they were going to suspend him for life, but they were not going to say that he bet on baseball. Yeah, I know and that. here's that what happened. Yeah. And here's what happened. They had the first press conference, and the first question to Jamadi was, "Did Pete Rose bet on baseball?" Now, the the the, the contract that they signed, Jamadi was supposed to say no. He didn't. He said, "Absolutely, Pete Rose bet on baseball." And then he dropped dead. If he were if Pete would have done a mea culpa. You know, Let me ask really you a question. Nice. Okay. So okay. Andy Pettit. Andy Pettit took steroids. Okay, boo, Andy Pettit, he took steroids. But then Andy Pettit said, oh, I took steroids, and now he's eligible for the Hall of Fame. He, Where's he, the logic in that? He's not He's not getting in. He might. He, no, he won't He might very well. He, he had a good record, the, good enough record. Close to, uh, close to the numbers for that. He's not getting in. He's got, he's got plenty of good numbers for that if you want to put him in. Look at some of the other Yankee pitches from the 20s and, 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 and Rube Marquardt and some of these other guys. I know, but he, he, he could get in. in. We'll see. In. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. Thank you so I much. I love Dad. this. This is, this is beautiful. Same time next week, same place, same four of us are all going to get together, and I'm predicting that we're going to solve there are all five of us. There are five of us. Wait a second. There are five, five of us. The five of us. There I don't even five of us. me, I guess. I, I, um, and we did it without any hitches, and we all got to talk, and we all got to. And P Peter Trunk and I, at the same time you were saying those things, we're going, oh, my God, this is fascinating. <laughs> we're just incredible <laughs> 
uh, like I say, a revelation, and uh, it's all for posterity. It'll all be archived on YouTube by the end of the week. Thank you, gentlemen. Same time Thank next you. week. Thank you. It was Hi. wonderful. Let's talk. Hey, this is Tony. Hey, I'll talk next week. Peter, all right. Very good. Well, what's the new Sounds take on it? Right. Sounds good. Take care, everybody. Bye. All right. Be Take nice care, problem. everybody. Bye. And listening audience, uh, you're just as lucky as I am. And um, this week, this has been terrific. Have a great one. Same time next week.